All right, the final chapter of Watchmen. The key question that we're going to be asking here is how do we respond to Adrian Veidt's plan of unleashing the alien monster on New York? Do we ultimately affirm his attempt to save the world? Do we disagree with it and condemn him as a mass murderer? Do we prefer Rorschach's insistence on retribution and justice, even in the face of Armageddon? These are tricky questions to answer, and rather than provide definitive answers, what I want to do here is explore the different ways you might go about attempting to answer the question, and of course what other questions or issues arise as soon as you begin, begin this process of ethical deliberation. Um, but first, let us just make sure we fully understand Veidt's plan. He explained it pretty well in the last chapter, chapter 11, but at the beginning of chapter 12, he, he summarizes it quite well. Um, so let's just take a look here real quick. Uh, so Night Owl and Rorschach, or Night Owl, I guess, in particular, is really convinced that this is ridiculous and couldn't have happened. And Adrian Veidt says, very well, once more, I engineered a monster, cloned its brain from a human psychic, sent it to New York, and killed half the city. Rorschach recognizes he's telling the truth. Um, and he says, and Adrian says he did it. Um, and going on. Night Owl says, I just don't buy it, any of it. You wouldn't kill half of New York. You couldn't. And Veidt says, I could, I did. If you like, I'll tell you how. And then he explains it. He says, the psychic was key. Poor young Robert Deschains. I acquired his brain after death, and my geneticist cloned something much bigger and more powerful from it, incorporating it into my creature. The brain was a psychic resonator. It would amplify a signal pulse and broadcast it, the signal triggered by the onset of death. We coded a lot of information into that signal. Terrible information. Max Shea's description of an alien world. Here admonishes images and Lynette Paley's sounds. Other than those killed outright by the shock, many will be driven mad by the sudden flood of grotesque sensation. And sensitives worldwide will have bad dreams for years to come. So note here, I, and clearly, even the creation of an alien monster is, we're pretty much in the realm of fantasy and science fiction. Um, you know, Veidt deepens it a little bit by saying that psychic waves are unleashed by the alien monster so that they are subliminally implanted into people's subconscious or into their brains um, so that they get these shocks, these horrific, grotesque images and sensations that make them so afraid and have such terrible nightmares that... Uh, they end up being terrified about the risk of an alien onslaught more than anything else. And he says, No one will doubt this Earth has metaphor so dreadful it must be repelled, all former enmities aside. Enmity is like hatred, so hatred between the U.S. and USSR. All right, so this is a common idea. We, we've, I'm sure you've encountered this idea either in uh, films and TV shows and video games of the only way to unite humanity would be to find um, some new external enemy to unite us all. Um, and typically that takes the form of an alien. No one will know. Those involved are all dead, killed by killers who killed each other, a lethal pyramid. My servant's death from exposure after drunkenly opening my vivarium provides its silent capstone. This is just an interesting point, by the way. Uh, I mean, what Veidt is saying here is uh, the, the secret is safe because anybody who knows anything is dead. Um... But what's interesting about this is we saw him kill his assistants, and he killed them through uh, giving them a, f a form of poison. Um, but, it, but interestingly, he lies here and says that they opened up the vivarium because they were drunk on accident. It's very odd that somebody who just mass murdered over 3 million people felt the need to lie about the fact that he just killed uh, three of his servants. Um, but clearly, right, I, I, this is going to be a theme I discuss a little bit later in this lecture. I, I think it further solidifies an aspect of Veidt's plan, which depends upon deceiving others, right? Convincing him that he had the most altruistic of intentions, um, that he was selflessly working to help humanity as opposed to implant himself um, in a beneficial role here. But regardless, the theme of deception, I think, is a big one in Chapter 12. Um, and so that, that I think helps us to understand what's going on here, right? If you remember the premises of his logic, premise number one was that on its current trajectory, human, human extinction is inevitable, uh, due to probably nuclear apocalypse, but also, uh, other factors such as economic collapse, social unrest, environmental destruction, all, all caused by these seemingly insoluble conflicts between the U.S. Uh, US and the USSR, or just the seeming, uh, incontractability of human nature 
nature's desire to fight and get into conflict and be in these competitions against each other. Um, and thus, there needs to be some sort of radical transformation in the system. Uh, premise number two, which I think we just saw in this summary here, is that the only way to get humanity to overcome the divisions that are leading to this insoluble dilemma is through the creation of a common external enemy, i.e. an alien monster. And thus, we see uh, Adrian Veidt's conclusion here, which very logically concludes that getting a team of scientists, artists, psychics together to create a monster, teleport it to New York City where it will explode, killing millions of people and releasing telepathic uh, signals into humanity's mind of horrific images, um, scaring humanity deeply and profoundly and leading them to put aside all differences and divisions to unite around the common goal of repelling the fear of an imminent alien invasion, thus is the very logical conclusion of Veidt's logic, as anybody would naturally conclude. Um, so, now we understand the plan. The question is, how do we evaluate this? And I think actually some clues to evaluating this um, become evident once we go back and look at some other stuff that was going on in chapter 10 and chapter 11, primarily around the Black Freighter. Now, we've been tracing the Black Freighter th story throughout the entirety of this graphic novel. Um, we understand what's been going on. The, the narrator of the Black Freighter, this sailor, his ship was attacked by this pirate vessel, the Black Freighter. These murderous pirates killed everyone in his crew. He was shipwrecked. Um, and he realized the pirates were going to end up at his hometown and uh, probably murder his family. So in his quest to do good, to uh, bring justice to these evil pirates, he sails on the backs of his dead shipmates. He ends up eating raw bird. He becomes increasingly animalistic and savage as he murders even a shark and eats raw shark. Um, and we see that his, his, his psychology is descending so thoroughly that he even gets to the point of confronting the abyss and attempting suicide. But as he jumps out of the raft um, to, to sink into the abyss of the ocean, he ends up realizing that he has in fact reached shore. And that's where we're at in chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is called Two Riders Were Approaching, and we'll see in the Black Freighter, there are two riders there. Um, as, as the narrator of the Black Freighter ends up getting on a horse with another rider next to him. Um, and we see this imagery of two riders all over, right? DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2, um, the president and the vice president entering uh, a symbol, of course, of apocalyptic destruction. We see that we are really at the fever pitch of apocalypticism here, as literally uh, Nixon has the nuclear bomb or, or the button to launch the nuclear bomb uh, handcuffed to his wrist with his finger hovering above it, waiting for any signal to press it. I mean, that's about as apocalyptic as you get. And of course, the entirety of this graphic novel, we have been led to believe that Rorschach is the one that we should be drawing the parallels between um, in terms of the narrator of the Black Freighter and his psychological descent towards violence and savagery in the name of imposing the good upon the world and the narrator of the Black Freighter, who also seems to be becoming savage and violent in his quest to stop evil. Uh, I would say that is the uniting force between the two of them thus far in the graphic novel. In the quest to solve the problems of evil, they become violent and savage and animalistic. Um, and certainly chapter 10 seems to be supporting this conclusion, right? As, um, as especially once they enter in uh, to the bar, you see Night Owl choking um, individuals in there as he finds out Hollis Mason had died. Um, one interesting note though, right? Um, Rorschach, some great lines from Rorschach, by the way, right? Uh, as Night Owl, for instance, is saying, I mean, what do we do? The stakes are so high and humanity is so close to the edge. Rorschach, as he's literally hanging from the edge, says, some of us have always lived on the edge, Daniel. It's possible to survive there if you observe the rules. Just hang on by fingernails and never look down. I mean, great Rorschach lines, right? Um, and as Rorschach enters in, same pose as when he entered into the comedian's house, um, you see a moment of actual humanity here. Uh, instead of the typical expressionless, emotionless face, I feel like we actually see some pity here and some empathy towards this child um, where he very much seems to see himself. And rather than punishing this this woman, he ends up not for the sake of the children. Um, a moment of humanity. And we'll actually see a couple moments of humanity uh, leading up to Rorschach's final act. Um, but nevertheless, I still would argue that in chapter 10, we are led to believe that, um, that Night Owl and Rorschach are meant to be paralleled with the Black Freighter. Uh, oh, by the way, another great example of Rorschach kind of having a human moment here. He, he 
says that that Dan Dryberg's a good friend and he admits that it's difficult being around him and it's kind of this awkward bro moment between the two of them. But anyways, um, this brings us now to the Black Freighter and let us start analyzing what's going on here. So uh, if you remember, he had jumped out of the boat. He's now coming back ashore and let's see what's going on here. He says, <clears throat> I was returned splashing noisily through the encumbering shallows, sun mulling the horizon behind me, a poker in a glass of sack. I could be no more than 20 miles from Davidstown. I was home. Yay, he's made it home, all right? Um, unfortunately, he has some pretty dark thoughts. He's like, by now, Davidstown was overrun. My family slaughtered. Only revenge remained. Okay, so he's on a revenge quest. Deliberating upon this, I startled at the sound of horses approaching, picking daintily across the shingle voices, male and female. Huddled in the dune's lap, I watched through a curtain of whispering marum grass. Just look at our narrator. He looks animalistic. Um, by the way, in the last lecture when I was talking about Vite being on the ocean and being paralleled with a certain image, uh, hint, hint, I think we're seeing an image that looks almost identical right here. Dismounting, they tethered their steeds to dark wooden groins, jutting, jut, jutting out like charred ribs from the beach. I recognized the man, a moneylender from Davidstown. Notice, right, moneylenders almost always have negative connotations um, given the morally problematic position they, they were in for, for many centuries in Christian society. Laughing, he walked his woman over pebbles down towards the surf. With Davidstown captured, why would brigands allow this scoundrel free passage for his midnight trysts? Had he collaborated, the ribald chuckling reached the water's edge, ceased, became a scream. My raft was discovered. So, okay, we're seeing here um, w the logic of the narrator, the Black Freighter, right? The only way that these people could be walking free is if they had collaborated with the pirates. So what conclusion does he come to? He comforted the weeping, hysterical woman, and my heart grew cold. Was my wife comforted before her execution while this collaborator and his pirate master sneered? Now they would report my raft. My decision was hurried but not difficult. Screaming my hatred, I rushed down the night slope towards them, but all that escaped my lips was the black language of gulls. So notice, on a figurative level, we've been seeing this type of imagery continuously throughout the journey of this narrator, the Black Freighter, where he, can, he perpetually or consistently is, or, or connections are drawn on a figurative level between him and animals, all right? He no longer is capable of making human speech. He is no longer intelligible through a human lens. He's become completely savage and animalistic, and clearly this coloring of red seems to imply that violence and revenge are the dominating aspects of his personality now. And of course, he grabs this rock and he bursts this guy head open, right? Over, overripe, the moneylender's head burst with a single blow, exploding as if pressurized by the guilt within. Straight headshot, all right? Um, suddenly slick, the rock shot from between my red fingers and was lost. The woman I strangled, this took considerably longer than I had anticipated. Okay, so that's that's pretty rough, right? Um and we're seeing, of course, the parallels between this and the broader world of Watchmen as there seems to be an increase in violence. And we see that especially in Chapter 11. Um, notice, by the way, as the Black Freighter, uh, as we continue to look at these, that on the back of the comic book, we're seeing an advertisement for the Vite method. Hmm, I wonder if there's a connection between these things. Let's keep going. At Death's Approach, all creatures discover an aptitude for violence. Flailing, scratching, she was a briar rose in the wind. The wind dropped, her thrashings became weaker, the horses watched, understanding only a little. When death was assured, resignation lent her eyes a, a certain maturity. So, okay, he has just murdered two people who have collaborated with the pirates. Uh, what's he going to do now? Um, he says, my purpose almost forgotten. In the giddy whirl of murder itself, I gazed stupidly at the horses. Recovering, I became more rational. Seeking vengeance, might I turn this unforeseen circumstance to my advantage. An idea blossomed, plausible, tempting. So, okay, he has an idea. All right, the notion fascinated me. It was terrible and yet terribly convenient. And this seems to be the theme for this narrator, the Black Freighter. He continues to get these sort of horrific ideas as a way to further his uh, quest for vengeance. And so, he says, this couple left Davidstown unhindered. Despite the pirate sentries, there must... There must be. They would be allowed back also. Tied to her saddle, she looked quite natural. Two figures had written here. Now two rode back. 
Soon, soon I would venture amongst evil men and make them fear me. Okay, so we understand his plan, all right? Switch into the moneylender's clothes, return back as if everything's okay. Uh, and this is where we're getting the two riders imagery here. Um, notice again, Veidt's utopia uh, is being connected. There. Or sorry, this isn't Veidt's utopia. It, it is a recurring symbol we've seen, but nevertheless, we've seen that Veidt is associated with the idea of a utopia. Um, and we seem to be seeing these things increasingly put in uh, visual proximity here. Now, of course, as soon as we see this image of violence and two riders, and then we turn the page and see Rorschach making someone bleed as he enters into this underworld bar and starts breaking people's fists, all right, we're, we're meant to see the immediate connection or parallel, all right? I think the most obvious connection would be to see these two, Night Owl and Rorschach, as the two riders. And of course, as Dan Dryberg finds out that um, that Hollis Mason was murdered by these knot tops, he begins brutally strangling them. And so even Dan Dryberg, someone who we viewed as a pretty uh, benevolent, kind, compassionate person, even here starts to transform into uh, into someone who has murderous intent. Um, right when Rorschach is is talking you down off the ledge of murdering someone or hurting someone, that's when you know uh, things are probably not great. Um, so, anyways. They, they continue their quest, and we get a little glimpse here, these artists, these scientists that now we know Veidt had hired to help create the alien monster. He ends up blowing them up and murdering them. Uh-oh. Um, so let's, let's keep going. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing too important here. We get some nice little Greek imagery about Veidt's understanding of death, but again, uh, we, we know the basic conclusion. Um, Rorschach's journal... An interesting one. This is going to be really important towards the end of this lecture as I talk about Rorschach's final a actions, but let's just take a look at it now uh, so that we don't have to skip back to it. So this is Rorschach's final journal entry, and we find out we, he has actually sent it to the New Frontiersman. Interesting choice. Uh, but anyways, he, he recognizes the danger, and he says here um, he could kill us both there in the snow. Nobody would ever know. Uh, very ominous and prescient in terms of what will happen. He says, offices below, headstones marking daily graves of thousands. Inside, across clock faces as observed as those of celebrities, hands commence final laps. And so we've seen the clock between the chapters clicking closer and closer towards midnight, uh, a symbol of the apocalypse. Oblivion gallops closer, favoring the spur, sparing the rain. I think we will soon be gone. Vite is faster than Dryberg, perhaps faster than me. Uh, spoilers, we now know that Vite is way faster and stronger than both of them. Return from mission seems unlikely. This last entry will shortly mail journal to only people can trust. Tell Dryberg I need to check my mail drop. He believes me. If reading this now, whether I'm alive or dead, you will know truth. Whatever precise nature of this conspiracy, Adrian Vite responsible. Have done best to make this legible. Believe it paints disturbing picture. Appreciate, appreciate your recent support and hope the world survives long enough for this to reach you. But tanks are in East Berlin and riding is on wall. This, this willingness of Rorschach to face oblivion, to face the apocalypse, to face Armageddon, I think is quite admirable, right? Or certainly there's something um, kind of badass about it. Uh, but obviously he's talking about the recent support being um, the support that the New Frontiersman gave to Rorschach in defending him as being heroic and American when he was in jail. Um, for my own part, regret nothing, have lived life free from compromise, and step into the shadow now without complaint. And those last lines are going to be the key ones to understanding Rorschach's final decision, um, which is about living life free from compromise. And certainly as we begin the ethical deliberation of whether we think Veidt's plan is good or bad, this idea of living life free from compromise versus Veidt, who certainly um, makes many compromises in the path to, his, uh, to implementing his plan, namely the compromise of killing three million people as a way to save the rest of the world and forcing the other heroes into a compromise of keeping silent as a way to preserve Veidt's newly established peace and utopia, um, Rorschach will take a different approach, and we will get there soon. Let us continue with the Black Freighter. And, and let us remember, the reason I'm analyzing the Black Freighter is because I think it gives us insight into what Alan Moore's value judgment of Veidt's plan is and gives us one lens through which to view Veidt's plan, uh, which is certainly what the close reading of the text seems to imply. So, okay, uh, Narrator of the Black Freighter returning now, all right? It says, unrecognizable in corpses' clothing, I was the concealed implement of God's retribution. 
All right, he is a symbol of God's retribution now. Banding the naked moneylender to the cold surf, I tied the horses from the beach. Ahead, David Sound lay sleeping, little dreaming what approached. Cantering down moonlit lanes, I spied the dark, unmoving form of a pirate sentry, watching sullenly uh, from atop an embankment. I held my breath, dressed, dreading lest he should attempt conversation. Trotting unhurriedly to avoid suspicion, I rode past. If he noted the lover's unusually early return from their assignation, the sentinel said nothing, perhaps assuming we'd argued. So notice, the narrator is not seeing things too clearly, right? He, he thinks he's real clever. He's like, oh man, if this sentry uh, notices we're not talking, he must just think that we got into an argument and don't want to talk anymore. Uh, not even realizing that this isn't even a sentry, it's just a scarecrow, man. Uh, let's keep going. The woman's head lolled stupidly. No living companion has ever been so agreeable. I spurred the horses on, whinnying, unnerved by death's scent towards that inevitable confrontation. Dear God, let me have vengeance, then die swiftly, delivered at last into hands of a higher judgment. So, okay, well, this reminds us all the way back to the opening of trying to be delivered into the hands of a higher judgment, and without that kind of higher power of a god, of some benevolent force um, implementing justice in the universe, he has to take justice into his own hands, and then hopefully be, be delivered into um, the hands of a higher judgment. Okay, and we see here Rorschach's journals delivered to the New Frontiersmen. And that wraps up chapter uh, chapter a 10. And then in chapter 11, just a little bit more of the Black Freighter here. Um, moving pretty quickly. We can see here the end, the conclusion of the Black Freighter narrator's uh, journey. So he gets back to Davidstown. All right, going to implement some revenge. Tethering both horses to the veranda, I entered my former residence noiselessly, careful not to rouse the butchers occupying it from their debauched slumber. All right, he's made it back into his home. He's going to implement some revenge on the pirates in there who murdered his family. Let's see what happens. He says, unaware that death was amongst them, they'd know its dark embrace without ever understanding why. One, however, was awake. Frantic lest he should raise alarms, I sat upon him as he entered the night-wrapped chamber. In cataract darkness, I bludgeoned him, his, shrill, his screams unnervingly shrill. No pirates came, but something worse. I looked up into faces familiar save for their terror. The children wailed. I looked down at the figure beneath me. Through puffed and bloodied lips, she mouthed my name. There came an understanding so large it left no room for sanity. As I fled past the mounted cadaver outside, lanterns flared in nearby houses. So what has happened here? Well, it turns out he was not murdering a pirate at all in the house. The person he sees here, who he was strangling and almost killed, was his wife, and who emerged but his children. So what is the understanding that has emerged that is so la large that has left no room for sanity that leads him to flee outside, um, where, that leads him to say, I ran, but the knowledge of damnation paced me, gloating, celebrating its awful victory is the fact that he just murdered some of his townspeople, that the Black Freighter never even made it there, that in fact he has become the very monster that he was trying to, uh, to, to avenge, or not that he was trying to avenge, that he was trying to take revenge on, that he was trying to bring to justice. He's become the murderous uh, individual, the murderous monster that he was trying to stop. Um, so... Pretty, pretty brutal stuff there. And let's just draw it out a little bit further before we can see all the connections. Meanwhile, what's going on here? I mean, I, I think chapter 11, right? It brings conclusion, not just to Veidt's plan and the deeper plot of what's been going on throughout Watchmen, but all these side characters, right? You see, for instance, Joey, the woman who has continued to go up to the newspaper vendor, um, have him put up posters and so on. She's been having troubles with her girlfriend, and now her girlfriend finally emerges. They've been fighting. And, and you see all these other instances, but it's going to primarily emerge from this relationship. They'll start fighting. And all these other side characters, uh, Malcolm, the psychoanalyst who had been dealing with Rorschach, the detective who's been, um, who, who's been decommissioned for now, all these other side characters are going to be wrapped up in these uh, struggles and fights and turmoil that I think are actually not not just related on a thematic level to what's going on in the Black Freighter, but going to dramatize some of the questions that Veidt's plan is raising um, about the suffering and pain and conflict that seems to be inherent in human nature and whether or not a plan that could seemingly get rid of those issues uh, would be worth any cost. Um, and so we see this continue, right? 
they start arguing, um, and you know, Joey, Joey is in deep and profound pain at the heartbreak of her girlfriend breaking up with her. And now we're back at the Black Freighter. Um, oh, by the way, notice here that as Adrian Veidt was talking about tearing Gordian knots, um, Joey is tearing up a book here called Knots, which is about relationships. And so you can see here, right, the, the difficulty of solving not just international problems like between the U.S. and the USSR, but also interpersonal conflicts like in relationships or just between regular individuals within society as opposed to, you know, just these large forces. I, I think... Uh, these individuals end up being the micro example of this larger macro question that Veidt is asking or that Veidt's plan forces us to ask about uh, conflict, pain, and suffering and whether a plan that could get rid of those things is good. So back to the Black Freighter. Eventually, I came to an ash-colored shore, a dismal black ocean stretching endless before me. How had I reached this appalling position with a love, only love as my guide? So this is the key to the tragedy of the Black Freighter. With nothing but good intentions, with love as his guide, he has been led to a path of atrocity and moral damnation. Um, and so, of course, right, in the next image, it is now becoming increasingly clear which character we are truly meant to draw the parallels between um, in terms of the Black Raider and the world of Watchmen as we see Adrian Veidt emerging on the shore, paralleling the exact same um, journey onto the shore as a narrator from the Black Raider. But, but as good close readers, let us not jump to conclusions. Let us draw it out all the way. Um, but clearly we see Veidt killing people here. Probably not good. Um, let's draw out to the conclusion. It says, Behind me distantly a lynch mob howled. The moneylender floated at my feet. Noble intentions had led me to atrocity. The righteous anger feeling my ingenious awful scheme was but delusion. So this is a classic story of good intentions, uh, of, of good intentions leading to horrible actions. As the proverb goes, the path to hell is paved with good intentions, right? If you don't have the self-awareness, you might end up becoming the very monster that you were trying to fight against. Um, and of course, we're seeing the news vendor here saying morally, we ought to strike first, talking about strike Russia. Where was my error? The freighter was heading for Davidstown. It should have already arrived. My deduction was flawless step by step. So ask yourself, which character has made deductions about trying to calculate aspects of the future? Hmm, I'm not sure if we're talking about Rorschach anymore. Pausing, I stood panting, sobbing, listening to the windborne sound of my pursuers. Closer now as breath returned, planning to resume my flight, I raised my head and saw her. He sees finally the black freighter emerging. Uh, she seemed to be waiting, not hovering to strike. Gradually, I understood what innocent intent had brought me to, and understanding waited out beyond my depth. So I start sailing out to the Black Freighter as he realized what a monster he has become. Notice in the background, right, there's more conflict going on here um, between Gloria, Malcolm's wife, and the newspaper vendor. She's looking for him, right? Um, he makes a classic faux pas and says, she says, have you seen my husband? He's a guy of color. And newspaper vendor says, I don't know, but maybe the black guy sells watches up the street, knows him. And she's like, what? You think we're all in some club together? You think we all know each other? And he's like, I didn't mean to say anything bad. All right. He does a classic faux pas, gets in some trouble. Again, more themes of conflict going around here. Black Freighter narrator. Unspeakable truth loomed unavoidably before me as I swam towards the anchored freighter, waiting to take extra hands aboard. There had been no plan to capture Davidstown. What could a mortal township offer those who'd reaped the wealth of the Sargasso? The ship was larger, nearer. I kept swimming. All my well-meaning plans had come to this. I choked, spat out brine, and struck grimly on. They'd come to Davidstown to wait until they could collect the only prize they'd ever valued, claimed the only soul they'd ever truly wanted. So we realized the Black Freighter's plan was never to murder Davidstown. It was to convert this innocent soul into one that had become corrupt and damned and evil, just like them, right? My shoulders ached. The ship was massive now. So let's keep going. Now we're in Bites Palace. All right, we looked at this. Do, do, do. Um, Veidt explains his plan. 
And now over here, right, as Gloria is trying to get Malcolm um, to come back home, right, and she is saying as a condition, you have to promise me you'll ask for transfer to different work with different patients. I can come home if that's what you want, right? But she doesn't want him bringing up any of that stuff back at home anymore, right? I'm not going to share you with a world full of screw-ups and manic depressives. I'm not going to share my life with them. So you can see the choice that Malcolm is confronted with. Uh, he had at the end of chapter... I think it was six, made the choice, right, to to acknowledge the depravity of the world or the inherent lack of meaning and purpose within the world. Um, and he no longer views this uh, life of comfort and happiness and pleasure and a belief in human goodness as something that is viable or tenable. And she is trying to ask him to come back into that world. And what does he do instead? Um, he gets distracted by seeing these people fighting. He says, Gloria, I'm sorry, those people, they're hurting each other. And she said, Malcolm, don't you dare. Don't you dare get involved. Didn't you listen to a word I just said? And this is actually quite a, a heroic line. Um, and, and I think there's multiple ways to end to, or to, to interpret these fights that are going on uh, between the side characters at the end of chapter 11. But I think certainly Malcolm gives us a, an example of actually the possibility for human goodness, right? That not all of humanity is about fighting or turmoil or pain or conflict, even though there's a lot of that there. And he says, Gloria, please, I have to. In a world like this, I mean, it's all we can do. Try to help each other. It's all that means anything. Please, please understand. So Malcolm has a pretty heroic ending here as he rejects the life of comfort and stability and happiness um, for one of devoting himself to really, truly trying to help those who most need it. Um, and she says, Malcolm, I'm warning you. You let yourself get drawn towards another heap of somebody else's grief. I don't want to see you again. And he says, Gloria, I'm sorry. It's the world. I can't run from it. So, you know, as we, as we get to the conclusion of these parallels between the Black Freighter and begin to ask ourselves some of the deeper questions about whether white society is preferable or not, I, I think only viewing the world as being full of conflict and pain and suffering even though there's a lot of that, is not a complete picture. I think we see some examples of individuals like Malcolm taking heroic action. Um, so never mind, let, or not never mind, but let, let us continue through the end here. We're almost here. It's dark and lurching bass filled all my vision. I saw the nails proud to its, or, or heads nailed to its prow. Heard drunken laughter, encouragements barked from the decks above. Closer it came, closer. And of course, we're getting more and more scenes of Vite. And now we get to the very end, right? The world I tried to save was lost beyond recall. I was a whore. Amongst whores must I dwell. A rope snaked down, sputtering, I grabbed it. And from the decks above, a cheer went up, both gross and black, its stench affronting heaven. So, okay, we now have the conclusion of the Black Freighter in his quest um, to stop evil uh, with nothing but good intentions guiding his path. He has committed horrific atrocities, become a murderer himself, and in fact become welcomed on the very crew of people that he was trying to fight against. He has become the villain that he wanted to destroy. Um, and so my argument, and I think it becomes very clear here, that the parallel is between not Rorschach actually, but Adrian Veidt. Even though it seemed as if Rorschach was going to be the one who makes this decision, I actually don't think that's the way this graphic novel ends. I think the clear parallel is meant to be between Adrian Veidt and the narrator of the Black Freighter. Um, and there, there's a couple, I mean, clearly thematically, right? Adrian Veidt is the one who launches or who murders people in the name of doing something good. Now, even though there's an argument to be made that Veidt's actions are good, I, I think the fact that the Black Freighter has been present in this graphic novel throughout the entirety of it, and we've become so invested in this parallel to the characters and events that are going on within the wider world of Watchmen, um, leads me to believe that Alan Moore is trying to tilt his hat and, or tip his hat and give us clear evidence about his value judgment of Vice actions. Um, and clearly, it becomes evident here through this parallel that he sees Vite as a monster. Uh, so that, that seems to be Alan Moore's perspective here. And actually, we can see this. If we open up, um, if we go back to, do, do, do. Well, let's let this open up real quick. Here we go. Sorry about that. If you remember from chapter five, okay, 
So chapter five was fearful symmetry, and this was the chapter, if you if you remember me arguing, uh, where the symmetry between the narrative of the Black Raider and the wider world of Watchmen becomes most apparent, right? Um, and not only that, but the technique of the chapter was to have a symmetry between everything within it. If you remember, right, this was the first page of the chapter, this was the last page of the chapter on the right, um, and the colors are paralleled, the layout of the panels are paralleled, the locations are paralleled, um, same, this is second page, second to last page, uh, third page, third to last page, again, car uh, colors, layout being paralleled here. Again, um, wide panel on the left here, wide panel on the right here, so on and so forth, all right? And so if you remember, we were using this technique of the parallels and the symmetry as evidence of symmetry being the primary technique used throughout this chapter, all right? Again, this is like the sixth page, this is the sixth to last page, both featuring the detective. Well, if you go through, and clearly the narrator, the Black Freighter story was central to this fearful symmetry. If you go through this chapter and get to the very middle of the chapter, all right, the 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 point at which the these uh, these ends meet, you see that what was at the center of the fearful symmetry all along was Adrian Veidt. All right, he is right here at the center of the graphic novel, reflected in this fearful symmetry, um, reflected by himself. Uh, and, and thus, it becomes very clear that the fearful symmetry, Adrian Veidt was at the center of it the entire time. And this is a brilliant stroke by Alan Moore to plant Adrian Veidt at the center of the fearful symmetry in chapter five, um, but to kind of dupe the reader as we're making our way through this, because at this point, we would never suspect Adrian Veidt as being behind any of this. We'd have no reason to. But now, if you go back and reread it and realize that Adrian Veidt was at the center of that fearful symmetry, things make a lot more sense. So, I think there's just a lot of evidence that uh, that Adrian, that we are meant to interpret Adrian Veidt as being the character that is paralleled with the narrator, the Black Freighter, which gives us hints about what Alan Moore thinks about the moral depravity of Adrian Veidt. Now, I don't want Alan's Moore, Alan Moore's opinion to be the final say, right? I, I want us to determine this in and of ourselves, but hopefully, right, uh, if, you, if you're interested in what argument the text seems to make, it seems to very much negate Veidt's, uh, or, or at least provide a negative value judgment on Veidt's plan. Um, and anyways, let's, let's see what's going on here in the final bits. As Joey and her girlfriend are fighting and as Malcolm is getting involved, right, um, the news vendor goes to get involved. He realizes as well that there is an intimate connection between him and his kid and this kid who have been sitting here the entire time. They're both named Bernard, right? Bernie and Bernard, they're the same name. There's a connection between them. So again, there's a kind of sense of solidarity between these two individuals that transcends the sense of isolation or turmoil or conflict that we've seen. Um, again, the detective here who's been suspended decides to get out of his car to go help. Um, these individuals, again, also decide to go help. Um, now, of course, uh, we see here as Veidt's explaining his plan that the imposition of his text over the image seems to dramatize the importance of his of his plot, right? He's trying to imagine a perfect plan to end fighting as we see great turmoil and pain here. And so I, I think there are two ways to view this. Do you view this as an example of the depravity of mankind that if we could have some way to overcome it, we should work towards that no matter the cost? Or do we view this image actually through the opposite lens as something that proves some heroic or good or altruistic quality of humanity as various individuals jump into this fight to try to break it up and to try to help? Interesting questions, and I think your answer to that question reveals a lot about your fundamental beliefs of humanity. Um, and so let's keep going right up to the end here uh, as we continue to see these images of fights and conflict in the streets. Um, all of these lives that we've gotten little glimpses into, and I think have provided so much texture to the world of Watchmen, um, come to a quite horrifying end here as they fade into white. And you can see, uh, you know, quite emotionally powerful and resonant. I mean, I, th I think this really hits home if, if you can have the imaginative capacity to have empathy for characters, even though they're fictional. Um, these two characters uh, holding each other in the final moment as an act of solidarity and compassion. Um, quite tragic, right? Quite tragic as they fade into complete nothingness. Uh, and remember, this is where we see the poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley, which I'll analyze closer to the end. Um, 
And that brings us to the opening images of chapter 12, which now I think, especially with the parallels of the Black Freighter, uh, you know, I think as an intellectual exercise, do you save, do you kill 3 million people to save, uh, you know, the entire world? It's very easy to just say, well, yeah, of course, you got to do it, right? Save more people. That's the only logical outcome. But I think Alan Moore really, and Dave Gibbons, I mean, we got to give the artist shout outs here really do a lot to drive home just the horrific uh the horrific implications of this plan right just these lives brutally murdered um and if you have any empathy for humanity you have to recognize that if you affirm Veidt's plan you have to live with this bloodshed this vi this uh brutal violation of human dignity um as the cost right you can see the pale horse sign here. Of course, it was a music concert, but um, uh, the apocalypse, the reference to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, of course, quite relevant here. Um, and notice this is seven pages of just a full panel image. And I think what's so haunting about this is the absence of any sort of live humans, the absence of any sort of dialogue. All we see here are images of brutal destruction and absence. Um, and you can see, right, the utopia sign here, the T has been removed. Uh, is this a sign of the cracks, the fissures of the utopia? Um, of course, up here you see the day the earth stood still. Again, an apocalyptic uh, symbol. Let's keep going. And I really hope you appreciate the, the horrific implications of this because Alan Moore, I mean, drawing us to these images with full page panels absolutely is meant to make it impossible to ignore the atrocity that has been uh, perpetuated here, right? Of course, Promethean, I think, you know, the question I raised in the last lecture about whether the pursuit of knowledge of, a, of an attempt to bring light to the world, like the narrator of the Black Freighter has done through his attempt to bring evil to justice or as Veidt has done to try to end conflict, um, here, at least in this image alone, seems to be, uh, seems to have quite horrific implications, just like it did in the novel Frankenstein. Um, you see the hero. Hiroshima lover shadows there graffitied on the wall, uh, the Gordian knot. You see uh, the Vite method right there on the comic book as the news vendor um, is over Bernie's body and, and his attempt to protect him. Uh, quite, quite horrific. And we see, of course, the alien monster. And I think um, this, this image is quite powerful, right? It is a, Veidt's plan literally involves a monstrosity. I don't know how you get more figuratively on the nose than that in terms of the value judgment that we should have towards Veidt's plan, or at least the value judgment that Alan Moore wants us to have towards Veidt plan, Veidt's plan of seeing it as something that is probably quite negative and uh, monstrous as opposed to something that is good and benevolent. And of course, this is juxtaposed or contrasted with the title of the chapter, which is A Stronger Loving World. Um, and so I think an interesting question that's being raised here subliminally, um, I don't think this is the core question, but it's certainly an interesting question, right? Veidt is trying to uh, create true revolutionary change. He's trying to revolutionize and transform the world in a very, very radical way, right? And I guess a question that perhaps is being raised here is, you know, are people who want to create a stronger, loving world, all right, people with these good intentions of trying to end conflict, of trying to create more equitable societies, of trying to get rid of the hierarchies and the oppression and the struggles and the pain that exist within our very flawed system of, of today. Um, does implementing that change, does creating that revolution require bloody cataclysm, cataclysms to transform, right? If one really longs to transform the current system, is it possible without recourse to violence, without committing some sort of monstrous action like this? Or is Veidt actually the only realistic thinker uh, who recognizes that any sort of grand change to the system will require some sort of violence, will require some sort of sacrifice like this? Fascinating question that I think is raised here. Dr. Manhattan, Laurie finally come back. Uh, Laurie is horrified. Dr. Manhattan, of course, is kind of detached from everything as normal. He's like, oh, wow, this must be really disturbing you. Teleports them away. Um, and so, all right, we are back here at the final final moments. Uh, comes on in and Adrian Veidt, right, is able to pull the one up on Dr. Manhattan for a minute. Uh, 
at the death of his cat feels terrible. Um, but anyways, and then he catches a bullet again, as, talking about the Ubermensch or super superhuman capabilities. Again, recognizing that Nietzsche wasn't talking about literal physical strength, but still, I, I think on a figurative level, we're meant to interpret Veidt's ability to capture a bullet as evidence that he is superhuman. Not not literally, but in terms of the fact that he was so well trained that he could catch a bullet. I mean, Jesus, how how much more badass can you get? Let's keep going. Um, he basically, and this is now the more interesting point I, I want to get to. So the first part of this lecture was really about exploring, I, I think, the value judgment that the graphic novel is making on Adrian Veidt's plan. And I think through the imagery or the parallels with the Black Freighter and the imagery of monstrosity through the alien at the beginning, we can see that it's probably quite negative. Um, now, the second part is about the creation uh, or a series of questions I want to raise or I think Veidt's plan raises about the creation of new political orders or trying to implement massive revolutionary change. Um, and we can see here, right, Veidt says, my new world demands less obvious heroism, making your schoolboy heroics redundant. Now, if any of you have read Brave New World, you should see the immediate parallel to Mustafa Mann's comments towards John the Savage in the final debate there, um, where John the Savage is, at, is saying, but this world that we've created where everyone is just on drugs all the time and feels nothing but happiness and, and just has uh, sexual intercourse with as many people as possible and there's never any sadness or pain or suffering, um, he says there's no opportunity to be a hero anymore. And by saying the same thing, right, in this world that I'm creating, there will no longer be a need for heroism, right? Your schoolboy antics, your schoolboy heroics are now redundant. Uh, if we can get rid of crime, if we can get rid of struggling and turmoil and suffering and conflict, we no longer need superheroes to dress up and fight against it. And he says, what have you achieved? Failing to prevent Earth's salvation is your only triumph. Whew, powerful line, right? The only thing these heroes have failed to do is prevent Earth from being saved by Veidt. And he says, yet that failure overshadows every past success. By default, you, us you usher in an age of illumination so dazzling that humanity will reject the darkness in its heart. So again, that Promethean imagery being drawn in here. Um, Veidt truly believes that he can solve the root cause of human conflict by uniting humanity against an external enemy, which will solve the darkness in our heart that makes us so savage and violent and self-interested. All of the critiques that, com that the comedian leveled against humanity in chapter two. Um, and Dr. Manhattan comes in, I mean, pretty, pretty cool moment, right? He says, I'm very disappointed by very disappointed restructuring myself after subtraction of my intrinsic field was the first trick I learned. And so it seems as if the jig's up for Vite, and he grabs the remote, and Dr. Manhattan says, what's that in your hand? Another ultimate weapon? And Vite says, yes, you could say that. And what do we have here? The news. And we find out from the news that his plan has worked, all right? Uh, there is an immediate end to hostilities between the Soviet Union and the USSR, right? Immediate end to hostilities, uh, end to hostilities, immediate summit in Geneva, end to war in Afghanistan, end to war. Um, and then he says, I did it. And quite a moment of triumph for Veidt. Um, of course, right, this moment of exuberance with uh, Alexander the Great kind of paralleled in the background, you know, is should be a little bit horrifying given the uh, deaths, the cost of all the human lives that were eradicated. Um, so let's keep going. He says, I saved Earth from hell. Next, I'll help her towards utopia. It's as Ramsey said, Cannon is devastated. Uh, Ashkelon is fallen. Geyser is ruined. Yenawam is reduced to nothing. Israel is desolate and her seat is no more. And Palestine has become a widow for Egypt. Um... And Laurie's like, wait a minute, next, after what you did, you can't get away with that. He says, all countries are pacified, are unified and pacified. And he says, can't get away with it. Will you expose me and doing the peace millions died for? Kill me, risking subsequent investigation? Morally, you're in a checkmate like Blake. And so now we're getting to an interesting question, right? And of course, the characters are persuaded. Um, he says, let's compromise. Dr. Manhattan says, Logically, I'm afraid he's right. Exposing this plot, we destroy any chance of peace, dooming Earth to worse destruction. On Mars, you demonstrated life's value. If we would preserve life here, we must remain silent. Laurie says, never tell anyone. We, we really have to buy this? 
He says, Jesus, he was right. All we did was fail to stop him saving earth. Jesus. And Night Owl says, how can humans make decisions like this? We're damned if we stay quiet. Earth's damned if we don't. We, okay, okay, count me in. We say nothing. So, all right, before we get to Rorschach's decision here, um, you know, I think the question we, that is being raised here is whether you're okay with political orders uh, or, or societies that commit horrific atrocities and utilize deception to achieve positive ends. Are the deaths of millions of people worth the near miraculous founding of a new and peaceful order, a golden age of international cooperation and solidarity, and overcoming of the suffering and conflict that has plagued humanity for perhaps all of our history? Uh, Do we regard the victims of Veidt's plan and more broadly the victims of history? All right. If we are to abstract Veidt's plan and ask, all right, what are examples of Veidt's plan that have happened in the real world? Right. Well, what are who are the lives? Who are the individuals whose lives have been trampled uh, in the name of creating a better, more perfect, more loving world? All right. Um, who are the victims of history? I mean, the list could go on and on, but you could point to the genocide of the Native Americans, uh, the enslavement of African Americans, um, the countless people killed under colonialism. Um, it's easy to sweep them under the rug and say they were a necessary price to pay for the overall progress of humanity. Um, and, and that's the question, right? Do you view those victims? Do you view the three million people as New York? Do you shrug your shoulders and say they are a necessary and unavoidable sacrifice? in the name of implementing a better future for humanity? Uh, If so, you're agreeing with the logic of the philosophical school of thought of utilitarianism, um, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, Actually, let's just go over there right now. Um, So utilitarianism, you've probably heard of this before. Uh, It's pretty straightforward. It's created by two thinkers, two Enlightenment thinkers, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, um, right towards the latter part of the Enlightenment. Uh, And it's fundamentally consequentialist in terms of its logic. And what do I mean by consequentialist? Uh, Utilitarianism argues that actions should be judged based on their consequences and their results. So it's not about the intentions. It's not about some sense of like some actions are inherently good or inherently bad. The idea of inherently good or inherently bad actions doesn't exist. It's all about the, the consequence of what ends up happening, okay? So in some instances... It could be very wrong to kill people. In fact, in most instances, it will be. But in some instances, it might actually make sense to kill somebody, all right? If that, if killing that person could save millions of people, then a utilitarian would say, do it. Um, and so a good action, the way the utilitarian judges what consequences are good and which consequences are bad, the way they define it is uh, what actions maximize the greatest good for the greatest number, um, specifically the the maximum happiness for the greatest number. Um, And thus, the ends can justify the means. And what do I mean by the ends can justify the means? Well, the end is about the goal that you have or the consequence or the result. If my goal or my consequence is to save as many people as possible, well, if I have to murder some people in order to save a, a much larger number of people, then a utilitarian would say that is okay. Whereas some people would say, no, the means can do not always justify the ends. If the means involve murder, you shouldn't do it no matter what. And so this is an interesting debate to have, right? And obviously utilitarianism would say, well, if it ends up having better results or consequences, then you got to do it. Um, and this is, you know, I, I think the most recent uh, interpretation of a utilitarian villain was Thanos, his plan to save the universe by, uh, by having populations um, as a way to create more sustainability to prevent the problems of overpopulation uh, is a strictly utilitarian calculation. Um, and so, you know, Thanos, uh, I think the Avengers series does a good job of not just having a villain who's evil just for the sake of being evil, but instead, just like Byte, having actually uh, fairly logical intentions um, based on this utilitarian logic. Um, so let's... Let's go back, all right? So that's utilitarianism. Again, pretty straightforward. I'm guessing you've been introduced to that before. Um, Now, all the other characters will be uh, persuaded by this, um, even though this requires lies and deception. And notice here, right? Uh, that That's one consequence of utilitarianism that's being raised here is, are you okay with a political with your government or some political entity or political leaders using lies and deceptions um, about atrocities that are committed if it's overall better for the stability and well-being of more people. 
Are you okay with that? Uh, that? That is a question that is raised here because obviously Veidt's plan depends on deception, blackmail, um, and of course, murder. Uh, let's keep going. Rorschach says, joking, of course, as Night Owl says, okay, count me in. We say nothing. Rorschach says, joking. They say, Rorschach, wait, where are you going? This is too big to be hard asked about. We have to compromise. And, Ro and Rorschach, pretty, pretty cool final lines. He says, no. Not even in the face of Armageddon, never compromise. So Rorschach is saying quite the opposite, right? That there are moral values. And if you compromise those moral values, you undermine the very notion of morality itself. Rorschach's strict moral code of there is good and there is evil and evil must be punished is something that cannot be compromised on. Otherwise, you undermine the entire validity of a moral system. That is Rorschach's argument, and I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, just a little bit more here. Um, actually, yeah, let's just go back to the PowerPoint right now and look at it. Uh, the theory that I would call this is what's referred to as the retributive theory of justice. Um, and the theory here is that, um, is that evil should be punished not because of any positive consequences, but because it is inherently deserving of consequences, all right? Or, or sorry, inherently deserving of punishment, not consequences. This has nothing to do with consequences, all right? And so I think the question that Rorschach is raising is, is justice more important than a utilitarian calculation of consequences? I, I, if somebody does something bad, should they be punished no matter what? Even if punishing them could have negative consequences for society at large. Um, so here are the key premises of this logic. First, only guilty people should be punished. Uh, only those who commit wrongdoings. All right. So innocent people should never be punished and only the guilt and guilty people should always be punished. Okay. Punishment should be equal to the wrongdoing. Okay. So if you steal something, you should have an equivalent amount of wealth stolen from you, so on and so forth. Uh, right. So there shouldn't be punishment should not be minimized. For instance, uh, if, for for utilitarian calculations, right? If you're like, okay, uh, for instance, imagine between countries, there was an example kind of like this. I, I forget exactly what had happened, but some uh, Chinese individual, like from China, had been arrested in Canada, and this was the head of some huge tech uh, company in China. And this individual had broken some sort of laws or supposedly had broken laws, right? And so justice, according to Canadian and, U and United States laws, said that this person should be arrested. Now, Canada, or sorry, China threatened the U.S. and Canada and said, if you do not extradite this person back to China and thus free them, right, that ultimately, uh, that ultimately it will damage the relationship between Canada and the U.S. and threaten trade, which will obviously, who will suffer? Many people, right, because trade between these countries is quite important. Um, and so, Obviously, from a utilitarian perspective, it's probably good to release that person uh, from prison, just send her back to China and let relations smooth over because that will be best for the greatest number of people. Now, if that person really did something wrong, though, do you believe that person should be brought to justice? Should they be imprisoned? Or if it's better for the economies of all countries involved and thus millions of people, would it be better to just release that person? All right. Veidt's utilitarianism would probably say, well, release that person if it, if it is good for society at large. Um, whereas I think Rorschach would say, no, it is inherently morally good to punish those who have committed wrong, regardless of the consequences of that punishment, right? Even if that punishment, even if punishing that person ends up costing trillions of dollars in GDP growth or economic trade, it is still better under this retributive theory of justice to punish that person if they have really committed something wrong. The key point is that retribution is not a consequentialist idea. It is not an idea justified by its results, but based on an inherent notion of morality. Um, and so this brings us uh, to Rorschach's ending. Um, but hopefully, uh, before I talk about this, you know, I, I'm interested in our final discussion to hear which which of these theories you find more compelling. Do you, do you end up feeling that there's some truth or some validity to this theory of justice here, that, that evil should be punished, that people who do bad things should be punished for doing bad things, that that is necessary to a system of morality, or do you side with Veidt, even if it is cold, even if it feels calculative, even if it results in murder, if ultimately it saves more lives, is that the direction we have to go? I mean, these are deep and profound questions to be asking here. Um, and so this brings us now to, to the ending of Rorschach, okay? 
and here we go right out here in the snow. I, I guess let's look at Dan and Lori for a second, right? They end up affirming, I, I think this actually affirms in a certain way, the horrors of the choice that they have been forced to make here um, by affirming life as being beautiful due to uh, their desire to live, right? And their desire to love. Um, and, and you see here, there's almost this sense of a kind of Adam and Eve uh, Garden of Eden vibe here as we see them in the next scene lying naked hand in hand. And it almost uh, is a symbol of the rebirth of a society under Veidt's new utopia. And so I think these two are supposed to be symbolic figures of a kind of Adam and Eve of this new world that Veidt has created. And they are marred, of course, by the original sin of agreeing to go along with Veidt's plan. So some powerful figurative imagery and symbolism there. And now we get to uh, Rorschach's ending. Um, and uh, Dr. Manhattan comes out. He says, evil must be punished, people must be told. Again, that retributive theory of justice, which is based on black and white notions of good and evil. And Dr. Manhattan says, you know I can't let you do that. And Rorschach says, of course, must protect Veidt's new utopia. One more body amongst foundations makes little difference. Well, what are you waiting for? Do it. And he pulls off his mask, right? Um, or maybe, sorry, this. I think this is actually Dr. Manhattan I, it's it's ambiguous whether he's taking off his mask or whether Dr. Manhattan is starting to uh, is starting to uh, move particles that forces the mask off or whether it's just the wind that's blowing the mask off. Regardless, I think it's important that we see his face here, right? Streaming down in tears, uh, truly tragic as he commands Dr. Manhattan to do it, to make this hero to make this horrific action, right? And I think Rorschach, He's, there's no getting around it. He has been deeply problematic throughout the entirety of the graphic novel, all right? His proclivity to use violence, his homophobia, the lack of foundations for the moral values he imposes on the world, uh, which, as we explored in chapter six, contradict his recognition that there is no God, that the universe lacks any inherent meaning or objective moral order, um, right? All these things are problematic about Rorschach. He's a philosophical paradox. He does things that make us deeply uncomfortable. However, I think we're meant to see something admirable or perhaps even heroic about Rorschach in this final moment. I mean, he's been our protagonist. It opened up with Rorschach. We followed his perspective more than probably any other, and we've gotten insight into his interiority. Um, but more importantly, I think here, he seems to be the only individual of all the heroes in this scene that respects the, the dignity of the individuals who were murdered um, by Veidt, and he stands in solidarity with them which of course makes his death at the hands of Dr. Manhattan, a symbol of the way in which Veidt's cold utilitarian logic could persuade even a godlike figure like Dr. Manhattan. I, I think this makes Rorschach's death quite tragic. Uh, and so again, right, the question Rorschach is raising is, would you feel comfortable living in a world based on murder, lies, and deceptions, even if it leads to more positive consequences? Or would you side with Rorschach's actions, right? Would you decide, would you side with his defiance, um, even if that means death, even if that leads to Armageddon? Is it better to uphold the basic values of his moral system um, than to abandon and compromise on them? Uh, fascinating questions. Do you view this end scene with Rorschach as heroic and admirable, or do you just view him as a naive fool who is unwilling to budge on uh, on overly strict moral moral values? Um, fascinating question to ask. Again, here's the kind of Adam and Eve imagery here. Dr. Manhattan kind of smiles. He's like, "Yay!" Hey. Um, we get some more image, uh, some more evidence up here. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, they, they believe an alien invasion is imminent. Veidt's plan is working perfectly. And so now we get the final scene with Adrian Veidt and Dr. Manhattan. Um, and Veidt says, I know people think me callous, but I've made myself feel every death. By day, I imagine endless faces. By night, well, I dream about swimming towards a hideous... Notice, by the way, this is a direct connection to the Black Freighter swimming towards a hideous ship, he was about to say. Uh, even his dreams seem to be thematically connected to the Black Freighter at this point. Uh, no, never mind. It isn't significant. What's significant is that I know. I know I've struggled across the backs of murdered innocents to save humanity, but someone had to take the full weight of that awful, necessary crime. I'd hope you'd understand, unlike Rorschach. So does Veidt's understanding here of the horror of his plan make him vindicated in some way? Uh, a question, right? And Dr. Manhattan says, 
You needn't consider Rorschach. I strongly doubt he'll reach civilization. But yes, I understand without condoning or condemning. Human affairs cannot be my concern. I'm leaving this galaxy for one less complicated. But you'd regain interest in human life, says Vite. Dr. Manhattan says, yes, I have. I think perhaps I'll create some. Goodbye, Adrian. And he says, John, wait, before you leave. I did the right thing, didn't I? It all worked out in the end. So notice there's an ambiguity, I think, always tied to utilitarian calculations, which is actually the inability for humanity to perceive the future. Um, and Dr. Manhattan gives an equally ambiguous conclusion that I think furthers this ambiguity and problem. He says, in the end, and he says, nothing ends, Adrian. Nothing ever ends. Um, and he says, John, wait, what do you mean by... And this is an ominous ending, right? He does not get the closure or the vindication he desires. The only way his action could be vindicated is if he found out the future would inevitably and certainly be better. But is there any way to ever know whether your the choices you make and whether the consequences, the calculation you determined about consequences is correct or not? There are always probabilities involved. Um, and perhaps this is a problem with, with utilitarianism. Um, and this is where we can talk about the connection to Ozymandias, uh, the nature name Ozymandias. Now, obviously, Veidt wants it to be about his return to the Egyptian pharaohs and their greatness and magnificence. But of course, Alan Moore draws us to a different illusion, which is that of Percy Shelley's poem from 1818. He's a British romantic. And let's look at it. It's a sh short and pretty straightforward poem. It says, I met a traveler from an antique land. All right. So this narrator met a traveler from an old ancient land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage, so shattered face lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Um, so what is he saying? He's saying a shattered statue, a symbol perhaps of greatness, right? Vast and trunkless legs of stone, symbols of stability or greatness or vastness, right? There's a shattered face. So this, um, this symbol of this statue of power, right? A sneer of cold command, probably a statue of a great ruler of Ozymandias, I, I think we're meant to interpret, um, has now been destroyed in a certain way or lies in a decrepit state. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my work, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So what, what is this poem about? This poem is about an irony. And if any of you have seen uh, Breaking Bad, notice that one of the episodes in the final season is called Ozymandias as well, a clear reference to this poem. Um, so this is a very popular illusion. And so what this statue, what was it supposed to say? So this is an ancient statue and it says, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on all my works, see mighty in despair. This is a symbol of, uh, of an everlasting political power, right? Look at the magnificence of Ozymandias. Look at how everlasting it is. He has created statues and, and pyramids that will last forever. But of course, what are we actually seeing here? Well, nothing beside remains. Most of the statue has been destroyed. Um, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. It has become a colossal wreck. It has been decayed. It has been laid bare. The sands of time have destroyed it. And so this poem is about the inevitable fading of all human achievements in the face of the onslaught of time itself. Human achievements are temporary. They are not everlasting. And I think uh, Dr. Manhattan's final words to Adrian Veidt, that nothing ever ends, in the end, nothing ever ends, is a good line that kind of captures the same idea. Things will keep going. Everything is temporary. Everything is always changing. Nothing comes to a definite end. Nothing comes to a definite conclusion. That only exists in a work of fiction. And I think it's brilliant on Alan's more on Alan Moore's part to do away with the idea of closure, of a definitive end that provides vindictiveness, that provides clarity. I think instead uh, the graphic novel 
ends on a point of radical openness, of, of, a, of ambiguity about what direction the future will go in. Um, certainly, you can see in the short term, there is a move towards Veidt's utopian vision, right? Peace on earth, happy, I mean, it's Christmas time, right? Um, we find out Laurie and Dan are now living happy Adam and Eve lives with totally new identities. Yay, and they're happy. Okay. Um, things seem good, at least at this point, okay? Uh, they go and visit the mom. Um, Lori finally finds out that, uh, or tells her mom that Sally knows, um, and it ends on kind of this tragic moment of her uh, wishing she could be with the comedian one more time. Notice the nostalgia bottle still in the background here. L oh, Sally seems unable to let go of the past, even in this new utopian future. Um, and then we finally get... Uh, the final little bit here, and you can see again um, some new, some new, uh, some new advertisements, some new things around in the city. Right, this is the time. These are the feelings. Millennium. We have the new Millennium uh, Cosmetics line that I analyzed in the last chapter. You see one world, one accord, international solidarity. Um, notice the Promethean cabs is under new management because the last owner died, uh, and then we finally get the ending, okay, um, where this guy for the New Frontiersman comes in, and it ends with the guy saying, we have nothing to talk about anymore because we can't bash communists, and he says, all right, go on, pick whatever you want from the stack over there, kind of the crank file, which is supposed to be, you know, stuff that's uh, junk mail, basically, and he says, all right, pick something from there and do it, do anything, and says, I leave it entirely in your hands, and his hand is hovering, right? Unclear of whether he's going to grab Rorschach's journal. Unclear of whether Rorschach's journal will be published. Notice the parallels well to the very opening image of the graphic novel um, with the comedian's smiley face with blood stained on it. Now, this is ketchup, not blood, but nevertheless, it is meant to be a parallel to it. Um, and so again, right, I think... I think this uh, stronger, loving world that Veidt has tried to create, we don't have clarity over whether the plan works, and we never will. Um, and, right, does that damn utilitarianism? Perhaps. Does the inevitable fading of all, of all achievements, does any solution, the fact that it will inevitably fail at some point in the future, that nothing lasts forever, um, mean that utilitarianism is always doomed to failure? Perhaps. But... Perhaps that's a that's a negative view to take, right? Wouldn't that doom us to never taking any action because we can never predict what will happen in the future? Is it bad to try to fight for peace if peace uh, can never can never be certainly achieved? Or does this only make sense in the context of Veidt's plan, where trying to murder people for the sake of saving others uh, becomes more problematic due to the inability to accurately predict whether that peace will be preserved indefinitely? fascinating questions to be asked, right? And certainly, I think this final page ends on this note of of the idea of closure being a fiction itself. There is no final conclusion. There is no final revelation. There is no final vindiction that makes clear what the future holds and whether one moral choice is better than another, okay? I, I What I appreciate about this text is it opens up a Pandora's box of ethical deliberation without telling you what to think. Um, and I hope in our final discussion to get to a the conclusion of why I think Alan Moore is doing this, why he doesn't just tell us this is correct and this is wrong, why he turns, you know, at, at times characters who seem deeply problematic like Rorschach and makes them seem heroic at certain points, or why he makes it so that people like Adrian Veidt, who seem like villains, uh, actually commit actions that we might have to agree with. Um, I think the graphic novel does a great job of portraying so many philosophies, their advantages and their faults, that it really leaves it in the hands, not just of this guy of Seymour to, to pick it up and decide, but I think we can interpret this on almost a meta level, that the that Alan Moore is leaving it entirely in our hands to decide what we think and what we decide is being correct or not correct. So this brings us to the conclusion of the close reading of the graphic novel. Um, we still have a final discussion to work through the conundrums that I think these this graphic novel raises, but hopefully, if anything, you appreciate the brilliant depth and complexity complexity, um, not just on a philosophical level, but also on the level of techniques, of the attention to detail, of the resonance between the visuals and the text, and all of the incredible uh, things that Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons have done here, I, I think truly make this work a masterpiece on the same level as the great works of fiction that exist, like a, you know, Herman
Herman Melville's Moby Dick or a Dostoevsky novel like Crime and Punishment or um, – or the Brothers Karamazov. I, I think those great works of literature, uh, Watchmen should absolutely be in that canon, should absolutely be part of that uh, entourage of, of texts that are considered the height of, of art. Um, and hopefully, if anything, these lectures have convinced you of why that is. So I look forward to our final discussion. You should be thinking about the questions that this lecture video raised. Be asking yourself, what do I agree with? What, what sounded persuasive to me? And most importantly, why? What justifications will you land on? How will you justify not just ethical decisions within your own life, but ultimately what values um, you hold and what you believe gives human existence meaning in the first place? Uh, a question that was raised in chapter nine. I think if you can answer those questions, you can get to the heart of what side of this debate you land on. Um, so I look forward to that discussion and we will talk soon.